don't just pay for leads, right? Like don't just pay for leads. Go out there and it's your business. Go, go be proud of it. Show it off. You know, having a diverse uh, amount of different channels is, is important because sometimes some of the channels aren't working as well this year. You know, leads are probably down 20, 30%. How do you, how do you get more to sustain that kind of that growth that you want to see year over year? G- given a world of possibilities where pros can like imagine they could dictate the customers like, you know, always pay them in one way. Is there one preferred way or does it matter? Or is there some sort of process that you tell pros that like, hey, this is what we're going to do from now on, here on out. Um, so obviously credit cards is definitely the most efficient and, and, and effective, but I don't want to tell you one, don't say no to money. There's always, <laughs> make sure you collect it before, before you leave. All right. Welcome to the Super Pro Podcast, the heartbeat of home service excellence. I am Roland Lightenberg. I'm the co-founder of House Call Pro and also your host. I'm an advocate for all the hardworking pros that are out there helping make our homes better, safer, and more comfortable. Through House Call Pro, I've had the privilege of supporting hundreds of thousands of pros just like you, empowering you all to achieve more stress less and redefine success in our industry. I'm excited because we're welcoming Brett Neal to the show, and he's one of the partners at High Velocity Accounting. And the reason we have him on the show is because he's helped so many of our super pros uh, on all different types of things. Um, typically, he helps companies that are in that $1 million to $10 million range, but he's also operated businesses, done the books, made sure those companies are growing. Uh, and so I'm just excited to, to nerd out here with Brett a little bit, and we'll, uh, we'll kind of jump into it. So, Brett, uh, welcome to the show. Tell me a little bit about what, what got you into the biz and, and why home services and, and why accounting? Hey, Roland. Thank you. Uh, thank you, first of, all, first of all, for having me on the show. I really appreciate the invite and I look forward to this conversation with you. Uh, what got me yeah. into accounting, man? Well, I've been, I, I would say I've kind of been a blue collar, blue collar meets white collar individual my whole life, just interested in stuff. But uh, you started out as an airplane mechanic, uh, went to went to Long Beach City College and, and worked on uh, airplanes that flew upside down, aerobatic stuff. So I just really loved working with my hands. Never really got away from the trades. Um, but I did take accounting. Actually, my first girlfriend said, hey, you should try this class with me. Ended up in it. Did pretty well. Uh, you know, long story short, 10 years later, uh, kind of found the marriage of getting out to hang out with uh, trades people. And especially since the trades has really just grown over the last 10 years, you can see the maturity. And it's been mm-hmm. fun to be a part of that. So my wife, Sisha and I uh, chose to really, I would say, saddle up and, and help out the pros. So, so tell me about it. You know, uh, your, your common uh, customer that you work with is like a million to $10 million business. You've, you've helped set some up from scratch, you know, from, from zero to one million. What's like the difference between a zero to one million dollar kind of part in a, in a company's growth and that kind of that one to 10? Well, we, uh, yeah, you have a, that's a good question. People kind of come to us from different, uh, f- you know, different phases of business. Yet you, you do have your startup and mature businesses and businesses that have really just been around a while but haven't adapted technology. Uh, maybe don't even know their numbers yet. Don't necessarily have books and records. Um, but in the you know in the beginning, um, for a newer company, it's definitely going to focus on on. It's always cash flow. Heck, <laughs> it's almost like the similarity between the two. Um, more similarities than dissimilarities. Other than a little bit of you know, operating procedures start to come into place. Um, perhaps a newer company is trying to find themselves a little bit. Whereas once you get rocking and rolling at three to five, everyone's got a routine. People are coming in at eight in the morning. Everyone kind of knows their role. You can just see things that are firing. A uh, newer company, it's getting that feedback is, was that marketing right? Was that call generated because of something that we did? Just the, the time and the delay and, and typically probably not having financial records to really support what it is you're trying to do. Um, it can make it rough. So, you know, the beginning, <laughs> I would say the suffering is harder in that first one, first, uh, first million. Yeah, definitely. And I think also as you're getting established and building a brand name and getting some marketing channels out there that are literally more than just, you know, the people in your inner circle or just like your, your first tier kind of like network, family, friends, people that know you um, and, and really starting to get out there. When, that's, when that's a great folks, point. Don't, don't just pay yeah. for leads. Right, like yeah. don't just pay for leads. Go out there and it's your business. Go, go be proud of it. Show it off. Yeah, no, and and, and I think you know having a diverse uh, amount of different channels is is important because sometimes some of the channels aren't working as well this year. You know, leads are probably down twenty, thirty percent for for a lot of pros. And so, what do you focus on? How do you how do you how do you get more to sustain that kind of that growth that you want to see year over year? What about a uh, 
you know, common mistakes that you, that you see companies um, do. You know, you, you get to see the inside of the books. You get to see a lot of the balance sheets. Uh, how are they operating? What are some just like common things where you're like, oh man, if, if only the pros, you know, would have done this or done this sooner or done why, you know, what, 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 do, you, what do you see out there? Uh, typically, especially house call pro, what we tend to see is the uh, um, o- overstated, undeposited funds account. So um, typically, whoever's kind of recording their books is just recording the deposits and probably recording them as sales or income. And meanwhile, mm-hmm. all of the invoices are coming over straight over as undeposited funds. And, and so what we're not really looking at is the balance sheet. Um, it, it, it doesn't need to be rocket science, but there does have to be some level of understanding. So I would say like it, the biggest mistake is just abdicating, just letting things happen and not actually kind of looking at it and, and trying to figure out what's going on. That would, that would be the biggest so, so when you come in there and you go, all right, business owner Roland, you know, you you got way too much in this in this uh, in this bucket. Um, how do we begin categorizing it or allocating it correctly? Like, what does that mean? So, I'm a definitely hands-on individual. Uh, we're going to take a look and and look at each transaction, um, more or less. We're going to get an idea. So, if I'm looking uh, at your at your revenue and your balance sheet, I want to get your accounts receivable correct. Um, that means that I should be able to go into House Call Pro and I should be able to see what invoices have been generated, jobs completed, but not paid. Uh, and then I should be able to tie that back into QuickBooks or whatever intact or you know whatever program you're using. Um, so I want to I want to start tying out the balance sheet. I want to make sure that cash matches my bank account, accounts receivable is something that's true. And a lot of people, a lot of pros, always tell me, you know, we don't have we don't have AR. Well, well, you do maybe for a day, maybe for a couple of days while while credit cards are coming through, and also mm-hmm. not all checks make it uh, from from the van to mm-hmm. to to the bank, right? A lot of them sure. get stuck in under floorboards or in back pockets or something like that. So it's kind of a double check. Um, one is did these people pay us, and and the other one is did it did it make it to the bank? Yeah, and I think with home service businesses, especially ones um, as are smaller, you know, the velocity of the jobs and the invoices that are coming through sometimes it's hard to just. It's just hard to keep track of, and, and and that can easily happen without an owner necessarily even knowing because they're just making sure there's just enough you know cash in the bank to hit payroll, and then boom, making sure that they've got enough jobs on the board for the for the next payroll cycle. Uh, what, yeah, that's the, that's know, the next level. Is, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, is anticipating, kind of anticipating the future, and that that really is hard when you're less than a million, knowing how many jobs you're going to have and how many jobs your your techs can generate. But again, after time, as you get a little bit more mature, you can really start to anticipate and budget a budget around that. That's right. And so, what what sort of tips do you give folks? You know, if you're out there doing jobs, do you prefer they do cash? Do you prefer they do check? Do you prefer they do credit card? Does it does it matter? I, I did want to. I wanted to mention that in your. You guys have um, bank check capture now in House Call Pro, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. love that feature. So any yeah. whatever it takes to get money into the bank the quickest. I don't necessarily mean like spending the money to get your funds in the bank as quick as possible, but um, definitely yeah. bank capture, take, p- taking pictures of checks. Um, made me think about that. What was your question specifically? Did, yeah, it, like given a world of possibilities where pros can like oh, imagine they can dictate I? the customers like, you know, always pay them in one way. Is there one preferred way or does it matter or is there some sort of process that you tell pros that like, hey, this is what we're going to do from now on, here on out? No, because you know, it's funny. Everyone's got some different way. I have guys that are on um, on QuickBooks that get like crazy interest rates because for whatever reason into it hasn't hasn't updated their credit Mm -hmm. card uh, finance fee Mm -hmm. or something like that. So somebody's always got some kind of some trick, but obviously credit Mm -hmm. cards just in general, that's the cleanest house call pro takes care of it. It's already batched uh, matches the deposit in, in QuickBooks. Obviously it's just the credits when those come through at times, but yeah, being able to manage the credit card is definitely the cleanest. Um, Cash is, is, is kind of susceptible to fraud, right? It's kind of like, where did that cash go? Um, a dollar just sitting on a table is much more vulnerable than a dollar in a bank account or in a locked up in a box. Um, right. And then checks, like I say, checks are just, they're all over the place. You got bad hand, you don't know if it was a good check. Um, so obviously credit cards is definitely the most efficient and, and, and effective, but I don't want to tell you one, don't say no to money. There's always, <laughs> make sure you collect it before you, before you leave. Yeah, I think that's the biggest like tip there is just like COD if you can, you know, while you're out there, while your technician's there, because otherwise you're going to have to spend time hunting it down or double checking. Did that clear? Did it make it? Did it not? You know, there's all kinds of other mental load you have to undertake, you know, even if, 
you use something like House Call Pro, it makes it easy to figure out who hasn't paid. You can do auto follow ups, still be able to collect it in whatever way that you can get it the fastest. Often is still the best way. And so, yeah, I love that you know, um, yeah. time time value of money uh, conversation. Yeah. But I um, I don't I don't necessarily mean how long it takes it to to get to the bank or or how long the, the revenue cycle necessarily is. Um, it is just simply in a high interest rate environment. How much you know? How, how quickly? Uh, what could you do with better with that money instead of it just sitting there? Yeah, that makes total sense. So, talk to me about asset protection uh, a, a little bit. Why? Why is it important? Um, what does it mean for pros that are like, well, what do you mean? Are we protecting my trucks, or what are we doing? Well, well that's, I mean, assets are are part of that. Trucks are a part of that. But I, at the end of the day, what I mean is cash um, earnings. So right now, you know, people are probably out kind of trying to. It's been a big push. People are trying to build companies to make them sellable. Uh, is it wise to operate it as a sellable company? Absolutely. And so one of the big terms is EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and, and um, amortization. I like to talk about EAT, earnings after tax, and that's really the cash, right? Net profit, earnings after tax. That's kind of what you're left to eat with. Um, that's asset protection. So big picture. Um, here at High Velocity Accounting, we my, my grandfather was a mortician, so I like to kind of joke around cradle to grave. Uh, we want to look at the big picture and not just look at – because a, a lot of owners don't just have a business. They might own the building that the business is in and they're uh, renting it back to themselves. Um, they might be involved in real estate. They might have Bitcoin or whatever. So there's a lot of transactions going on that are not just in the company. And if we can look at your life as a whole and do tax forecasting and tax planning projections – um, and look at how, especially you know, in a, in a um, changing environment, tax law changes, how that might affect you, then we have sure. a better opportunity of at least protecting the work that you've done. Uh, and that's, yeah. and I think it's easy to make money. And I, you know, I say that kind of in parentheses, it's, it's harder to keep it. Yeah, and I think you know, having that holistic picture, oftentimes there's extra things that you can do than if you're just only looking at the business you know, as, as its only focus. Uh, whereas there might be other life events or other things that you can structure things. Um, so you can do things in a tax advantage way. Uh, and if you have the ability to do that, why not? Uh, and I always say like, if your CPA is not helping you see that bigger picture, you should probably kind of rethink it because there's a lot of savings there, which is exactly what you're saying is like, you know, it's kind of easy to earn it. Um, but, but keeping it is even harder and making sure that you're allocating things correctly. You know, the U.S. tax code is built in a way to, to favor, you know, business creation and, you know, keeping it that way. So uh, there's a reason why. There's a reason why. And there's a reason why people like Brett, you know, build businesses and have jobs. Um, it's it's important because it pays for itself many times over, especially if you have a good CPA. Man, there's been so many times that how we've, uh, well, kind of clear to get off the phone and go, well, we just paid for ourselves, you know, yeah. <laughs> when we do get to help a client in that, in that degree. And I think it, there's times I think, you know, that's going to fade off, like, uh, clients have come on board with messed up bookkeeping. We've fixed stuff. We've we've corrected back um, returns, amended returns, mm -hmm. um, and then and then I kind of start to think, you know, hey, I can't, I won't be able to do this for you every, you know, I can't do this for you every year. We're not going to get this kind of savings. It's up to you to go out and build a business. And then sure enough, yeah. something will change in their life that there is a tremendous effect that we can still help and save them on. So mm -hmm. always something, mm -hmm. always changing. It's definitely a changing environment. And to have someone in your back pocket just to ask, at least ask questions to is, is, is certainly helpful. Yeah, I think it's wise for people, especially during an election year, whichever way it ends up going, you know, there's going to be a slew of new things that becomes available or another slew of things that become unavailable. So, okay. you know, making sure you're able to, um, you know, take that bonus depreciation on things that are finally allowable or that are no longer. Sometimes you might want to accelerate and put it in a different year. You know, I think it's really hard for businesses sometimes, you know, they're operating purely on a cash basis and not on an accrual basis. You know, there's some extra things that maybe you could do a little bit if you are running an accrual basis, even though you're operating in a, you know, a cash flow kind of a world, um, in a cash constrained world. Yeah, that's a big part of it is really uh, cash, hybrid accounting, full accrual, uh, you know, mm -hmm. are you profit first? I'm like, well, you know, what are we really trying to do here? Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know, I, I recommend accrual. I've, I've talked to other coaches and, you know, hey, when did you go accrual? At what, what level? Brett, day one. Like, the, right? Companies that really go out and crush it. Day one. We're paying attention from day one. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Then that then that's the way it needs to be. Um, yep. Accrual is a little bit tougher. But yeah, if you're cash basis, just again, just being able to read that profit and loss statement and, and looking, making sure that the balances are, are reasonable and that you have some expectation for it. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about just like budgeting in general. 
you know, I feel like for pros, sometimes it's hard because things are so seasonal and it's different for different types of trades. HVAC, obviously, probably now is coming off of their volumes finally starting to drop a little bit, coming off of like where you can kind of spend and you don't have any things to really worry about. You don't have any existential risk, uh, but it starts to slow down. And there's other businesses that are just going to start, you know, kind of coming up, you know, or businesses that are, you know, window cleaning during the spring and summer and then turn into, you know, holiday lights and decor and all kinds of stuff during the, during the winter. Um, how do you tell your clients to start thinking about budgeting and, and forecasting for things they might or not have even experienced yet because they're so much earlier on in their path? Man, I, I love I, – we didn't plan this one, but I love budgeting, Roland. <laughs> That's a great question. I do have one. Uh, is there ever a point in time um, maybe in House Call Pro where I could see com- budgeted number of jobs or compared to budget or um, something like yeah. that? Is been missing that one? Yeah, within, within within reports, you know, you're obviously able to see um, previous performance. And so that's an easy one to go off of if you're kind of thinking about, all right, if I had five people and I did X, now I've got 10 people, um, I should be doing Y. Um, yeah. So there's some mental computation. Um, we don't yet have the ability to set in like, here's here's what I'm shooting for and how do I compare to what I'm shooting for? So setting that in. Um, and that's but there's I'm, actually some cool that, things that, that are going to be popping up here to be able to do something like that. Nice. I love that. Because that's what I love about budgeting is it is so easy for uh, contractors, uh, um, um, le- leaders in their company to get, to get pulled a, a million different ways. But budget keeps you on track. And, and because we can bu- – um, it's not a question. You know, like in our with our clients, we do it. We, we tie it into another program, SaaS program. Uh, QuickBooks links mm-hmm. into it. I can see. I can break it down mm-hmm. by HVAC install, HVAC service, memberships, whatever, right? And then have my uh, percentages kind of expected, and, and have a whole P and L based on where where that client landed that uh, that month. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's important to see because exactly just like you said hey this this many techs were able to do this many jobs they generated this much income it came from this marketing lead referral google uh yelp whatever it, it, right that's what that's what kind of started the whole thing and then at the end of the day this yeah. is how much money we earned and so i love building in like you mentioned the seasonality um you know if i can take the 12 months and find my highs and my lows and then build a seasonal seasonal budget around that at least then we have expectations if you have a roadmap an expectation uh, we're good to go because <laughs> there, yeah because there, it cuts sorry just real quick because there's not I, I i swear every quarter it starts over again like man what are we doing where are we heading ah let's look at that budget it's let's get that back on track and budgets can be hard on day one right we set this budget this was the goal and the phone didn't even ring but that's not the point the point is that's to get everyone riled up. Hey, next steps. We know what we need to do next. Yeah. I think something that's interesting when it comes to just like forecasting seasonality, the other interesting piece is, is weather. And so, you know, for us at House Call Pro, you, know, you can really see clearly when there's, there's storms or unseasonably hot or unseasonably mild uh, kind of climate and the effect that it has on the amounts of jobs that, that our pros are doing. And so, you know, those are some other things to kind of take into consideration, too. If you're like, why did we hit budget or miss budget or go over budget on certain things? Uh, because there is always these black swan events. And just, you know, I think in today's time and all those things, there's going to be more variability in a lot of the stuff that we're doing. Uh, that's, that's maybe not as uh, forecastable, but you have to have enough cash to survive. Let, let's talk about that, you know. When someone goes, all right, right, like, what should I be having at my bank account? Should I be running it at like near zero and just making sure that, you know, this cash, whatever I can pull out and discretionary earnings is like earning some sort of APY somewhere else? Or, you know, like, what, what does someone need to have cash in the bank on any either payroll cycle or monthly cycle? How do you talk about that? Yeah, that, I mean, that's tough. Um, there's a lot of personalities out there, and I'm not trying to uh, necessarily run everyone's company. Uh, that would be a different role for sure. <laughs> um, but what, what you'd be, we're you'd be an owner at some point, <laughs> right? Yeah, you know, yeah. And, and I mean, in, in our in our company, um, Cisha, Cisha, she loves the whole six month thing. I, I'm, I'm somewhere in between three to six months. Not a not a big deal to me. But with clients, it's cash flow. At the end of the day, is cash flow. So right, we know we we got to make the majority of our money in the heavy hitting months to support the low months. Um, we also probably want to expand and, and educate our crew. We might need to, re- to buy a, a couple of new vans. Uh, we might be looking at some more commercial real estate. 
Uh, we might have debts and loans to pay off. So cash flow is super important. Um, and, and it kind of does start out, how should I pay myself? You know, it's like, I, I hate when you go to the, the sales guy and they're like, well, what are you looking to spend? <laughs> it's like, well, what? <laughs> it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't even know what that means. You know, and so it's like, well, how much money should I be taking home? I'm like, I, you know, again, I don't want to play that role. It's, it's let's make sure everything's covered. Um, right. Your monthly expenses are covered. Let's make sure debt's covered. Um, let's make sure the operations are covered. And then, and then, and it, everyone's kind of playing in their role. And that takes a little bit of a little while. If we onboard a new client, you know, we can't do that necessarily in the first week or even the first month. It's kind of like, Hey, it depends on where we're at in the season too. But, um, right. It, you know, once we get going with them, we, we start to see, um, um, kind of a month to month, then a trend. Then, um, you know, then you're able to start to tell that story and kind of put those pieces together a little bit. Yeah. All right. So let me ask you a little bit of a controversial question. It gets kicked around a lot online. Um, you know, a lot of folks say you got to spend X percent of your gross on marketing. Now, I think the answer could always be like, depends. Are you a high growth company or are you just an efficient company? You're looking to grow. You know, obviously you're looking to grow. You got to spend more and those are highly correlated. But, you know, what's the range that you see and what do you feel is like, typical for you know this this one to ten million dollar journey i I think the number out there is eight to ten percent is what people love to talk about um i i see that i actually see around three to four percent in a lot of my companies that we work with um i hate to see them just give it to google if if there's Mm -hmm. not it's like well what's your booking rate so i mean that's a great thing about having the telephones tied to, to house call pro is being able to get that booking right in there and listening to the phones and i know so so that's that's important right um and then also to recognize that what we're kind of saying out there just grossly if, if people understand what i'm saying um 100 gross revenue 50 percent cost of goods sold 50 percent gross profit 25 percent general administrative uh, expenses and 25 percent net profit that's kind of a healthy company um, it doesn't leave a lot of room in G and A to have people will talk about growing if they're having a growing company and talking about having twenty five percent marketing. Well, you have yeah, your, right. Oh, suddenly there's there is no net profit there. So um, yeah. it has to be a balance, uh, and you probably really need to know what area you're operating in. We do have operators um, on the west coast and the east coast and north and the south at different revenue levels, and you know mm-hmm. I'm not trying to compare them to forty or hundred million dollar companies. It's hey. What is a similar HVAC company at a $5 million revenue doing in your area? Um, and how could you mm-hmm. generate more money? So definitely That's need right. to- and mar- it, Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was saying like, that's right. And I feel like, you know, there's this, this rule of 40 where, you know, you take your, take your growth um, and your EBITDA and you try to hit that 40 mark. And that's really common in, in, you know, software companies and publicly traded companies. But is that something that, you know, is there a similar kind of a rule, like a, like a Brett Neal rule of home service thumb? Or is it truly really like, hey, what's a similar company in a similar area doing? Uh, t- I like to give a little bit of feedback. I mean, obviously I can't tell like who my clients are when we're having those conversations, sure. but no, I don't have any hard and fast rules because, um, we, shoot, if I'm listening to podcasts and I'm listening to all the other operators out there, it's wildly different. <laughs> and so, mm-hmm. yeah, there's some mm-hmm. ideas and whether, you know, and, and I haven't, uh, I haven't worked with Conquer, but it, whether it's, you know, CEO warrior or next I've worked with all these other coaching companies and everyone's just got something different whether their chart of accounts is set up different, their percentages are different. Um, it, you as an operator, you need consistency and you need to know, um, and you need to know the trend. So if we can put the same numbers in the same spot <laughs> month after month, um, one way or another, you're going to have an idea feedback of what should, something needs to change or what you could grow on. Yeah. And I feel like some people maybe overcomplicate it and they're like, oh man, I got this new chart of accounts that like I saw posted online. I, I want to switch to that. And then it's like, well, okay, if you start doing that, you know, you, you can, uh, but you got to wait a little while for those trend lines to grow. So even if you don't have a perfect, having something in place, being able to compare month over month, year over year, those things are really important. And so just being able to make sure that it's organized enough that you can start spotting those trend lines will give you enough operating leverage to make decisions that you need to positively or negatively, you know, affect your business, which you shouldn't be doing. Yeah. And then just, and just staying on top of it and watching it. You got me thinking though, the one, the one thing with marketing and stuff is cost, cost per acquisition. I don't, I don't mm-hmm. think most people really mm-hmm. understand that number or have that number. Um, and 
and following it all the way from the phone ringing to acquiring the client. How much does that actually cost you? And how many times can you do that? That That is important. And then you get back, then you have just that one formula, which is what gross revenue divided by booking rate divided by closing rate times your average ticket times your cost per acquisition. And that should be your marketing spin. But should it? Yeah. Should it be? Or should you just buy more cookies? Should you send more flowers? Should you just put up, I don't know, you know, like different ways. There's yeah. different ways. There's different ways. And I think there's also, you know, uh, what's the lifetime value of a customer? Like, would you spend more to acquire customers if you fully understood what the lifetime value is? Because you might be just running tune-up specials and just waiting for the system to break, you know, exactly. um, point, because yeah. maybe there are three to five year old systems, right? That are not ready for a replacement yet, but they will in a couple of years, or at least you can start pitching a replacement in a couple of years. Um, but, you know, if, if you were just to look at just the cost acquisition of those ones, you'd be underwater. You'd be like, why the heck are we spending any money? Uh, but if your follow-up game is strong, your service agreement or your membership, you know, game is strong, you you have the ability to actually drive the LTV to cost acquisition to make it worth it. Um, are a lot of your clients thinking about the lifetime value of customers or is it still uh, largely based on kind of that, that first time revenue coming in through the door? Yeah, I would say first time revenue, typically, typically yeah. speaking. And not that these, uh, yeah. these um, you know, when you're, if you're in the one to 10 million, you're probably, probably young, kind of somewhat, somewhat young uh, company, you know, for maybe even first mm-hmm. five years, still growing. Um, perfectly okay. All that stuff is good. Um, it's data, right? It's like what you just said, you just said a lot of stuff, <laughs> lifetime value. And yeah, and thinking about like, man, maximizing, right? All of that stuff. I mean, that's data driven and you, it's best to start collecting it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so in a house called Pro now, we've got, you know, if you click on a customer, you can see like the lifetime value of that customer. So if you're attributing lead sources correctly, you can start to kind of understand if you take the, you could even do something so simple as like, how much in total do we spend this year? on marketing, you know, and what's the lifetime value of all the clients so far that I've gotten this year. And then you just cohort it, you know, you, nice. so you keep that and you keep running that cohort of that customers over and over again. And then that, you know, you're still not getting like what channel is the best and whatever, but at least you're starting to see kind of a trend of like in general, I'm acquiring customers profitably or at least profitably over the lifetime of those customers over time. Um, I love it. I wrote so that one down. Speaking of, there we go. Spe- speaking, uh, so speaking about House Call Pro, um, what's, what's maybe like an underrated kind of like nobody talks about it type of House Call Pro feature that you feel needs a little bit of airtime, a little bit of love? Well, I, I mean, for me, it's just it's the call, the call booking, calling, having the, the phones tied to House Call Pro. I don't see I don't I haven't uh, of my House Call Pro clients. I, I feel like half have it. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's just it's it's having it tied in, being able to. Um, I mean, just follow it all the way through seems pretty sure. amazing to me. And then diving into the reporting, if we're going into budging and that kind of stuff, I would say that seems to be the underrated one, but I'm not, I don't know. I don't know the other side from House Call Pro, which one is the most underrated tool? <laughs> well, I think it's different by different size industries, but I will tell you that VoIP is a new product. So I think it definitely is underrated in terms of like product adoption because changing your phones over is a big deal. And I think when you're in the zero to $1 million phase, you could still probably run off of just an owner's cell phone. You could probably do the zero to one phase there. But once you start getting over that, you got to start making sure you're doing like routing, ring groups, you got rules, you got call tracking numbers, like you really still got to start diving in. And so I think, you know, if you're ready to make that, that jump, you know, beyond 1 million, if, if you're not using you know, some sort of call track and some sort of VoIP, some sort of ability to like, you know, QA and listen to calls, you know, you sure you can spend more money on leads, but if you're not booking them, then what's the point of buying more leads, you know? And so for a lot of companies, it's not just about like dump more money into marketing. It's just like, Hey, coach my CSRs or coach whoever's right. answering the phone, right? To do right. that. Uh, you get way more lift from there. I'd rather spend $2,000 a month on a coach just for the people answering the calls, then spend $2,000 more on, you know, a hundred leads from, from Google, for example. No. And I love the call routing thing. That's awesome. It's the, like now 30 seconds. She didn't ring, pick up this one. Let's make sure somebody gets the, that, that phone answered. And yeah, for sure. That's right. The other one I was going to say, um, I would say, is it, I don't know how you guys term it, but like margin costing, being able to put in mm-hmm. the markup, yep. um, yep. that, that, builds consistency. Um, I think it's, there's a lot of fear around it. It's because like what spit out, like, well, you got to test a little bit, but, um, yeah, I think, mm-hmm. I think that's a, that's a great tool as well. 
Yeah, job costing is funny because it's not like sold as a feature or as an add-on. It's just a thing that you can like activate. And if you're building your price book in a way that you can take advantage of, you know, being able to mark things up, you know, if you do that on a consistent basis, you know that, you know, the washers you're marking up at, you know, 100%, but, you know, maybe the water heaters, you know, you're only marking up 10%. You can only do that because you can only charge so much for a certain type of thing. Um, but if you're doing that consistently, then you know when you're putting together any kind of proposal, you know, you're going to have the right kind of profit built into it so that you can operate your business in a better way. Uh, yeah, it takes a while. Check- it takes an investment, but. It does. Exactly. And tracking, you know, but that's really, mm-hmm. that was the whole conversation I felt like all along is uh, we can't abdicate this stuff. As the owner, some way you need to kind of know what's going on uh, and, and definitely mm-hmm. the price book. And, and I love, yeah, I love the margin costing with House Call Pro or what do you guys call it? Yeah. Job costing. Yeah. Job costing. Yeah. Yeah. And so. Uh, if you were to take on a new client uh, and they weren't using any kind of uh, field service management or CRM, uh, they started using House Call Pro. What's something that you would tell them to start doing like straight out of the gate? Price book, man. <laughs> Let's get into that. Mm-hmm. Get into that price book. It's uh, yeah. start getting all that data in there and uh, and and building out invoices and testing. And then you got to share that with your techs. You got to make sure that they know how to use it and that they can confidently build out um, the service that they're generating at the home. So I, I feel like a lot of it is around the price book. I feel like it, the price book is art. It really can be. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. it, it's not just because people, I look at it this way. It's not like somebody's coming to your store and comparing one item to the next and they can just judge on price and touch and feel. It's really just on what your tech was doing that day and the weather. And there's so many things, you know, that could have could have gotten a car bender right before you showed up. There's just emotion. People are tough. So at the end of the day, price book and selling it is art. And, and is there the right price? Of course, you should struggle and try to be the right price. Um, but delivering that is just going to be difficult or or easy for some. And and that's going to evolve around the way your price book shows it. And, and uh, you can show off your pictures and you can. Um, maybe show, you know, good, better, and best and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So do you, so if you had a choice, would you recommend someone to like purchase some price book they found online or slowly build up their own from scratch? I hear both ways. I I hear both ways. Uh, It's, I don't know. Again, I'm not, I don't, I'm not an operator of, and there's so many different types. Um, obviously you guys know as tradesmen, right? Well, there's garage door, roofing, plumbing, um, and I hear good and bad from both sides. I hope that as a new user, you are somewhat, um, I hope you're not trying to just do this all new day one. Uh, but I guess that's probably what it would be like, Hey, I'm leaving this guy and I'm going to go start my own business. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. you should probably use the tools around you to help you out. See what a good price book looks like. Something like that. Um, if you have a, I don't know, if you have a friend, you should talk to people, but if you have the, if you also have the time and the diligence and you know what you're doing, I would say build it out yourself. Yeah, I think ultimately uh, you are going to want to build your own because that means you have a full understanding of what everything it takes to make your business hum. Uh, But, you know, sometimes it's easy to just push the button, get something so you can kind of start to understand and you can get, you know, up and running really quickly. But I think ultimately, you know, your IP, what's special about your business, the way that you word things, you know, the way that it's customer facing, you know, you don't want just to be a whole bunch of technical jargon that homeowners are going to be like, oh, I don't know what this is, you know, um, it may be a strategy. We're like, you know, here's all the stuff you don't understand. You just need it. Come on, Brett, buy it. But, um, you know, I'd say like in general there, you're right. Therein lies a little bit of the art because that's, that's what it takes to run a home service business. I was waiting for you guys to drop AI into like the description boxes, right? Just <laughs> help me fill out what this part is with bold letters and stuff. Totally. Well, you know, we've got a bunch of different AI team members at House Call Pro now, and those things are releasing and the ability to make something a little more customer friendly uh, and explain it in a way that a homeowner would understand uh, are all clever prompts and things that uh, yeah. are starting to get slowly integrated into, awesome. you know, um, what what we're building a house called pro because sometimes you just don't know how to say things you know i don't know how to say things and i like to ask ai all the time and it sure does a good job so uh <laughs> it's all about leverage and making sure you're just using the tools uh that you've got at your disposal yeah absolutely and i think house call pro is a great tool um you know it's 
one of those things do you need to use every tool like quickbooks like there's more mm-hmm. than one way to skin the cat within quickbooks um people always show me some new way i'm like oh my gosh i whatever so <laughs> however you kind of need to navigate it but do use the tools get in there and look mm-hmm. at the reporting the reports are there they definitely are there um you know the price book is there um capturing commissions capturing um burden rate i think is very important for a lot of companies to understand i'm not saying necessarily that's captured but in a way it can be captured in house call pro and 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 then built into your job costing so it's it's really you know call by call um not abdicating business is easy as long as you're doing it (laughs) yeah and and you know you're running in the way that you want to grow the business you know you've got a way that you know, you started the business and you want to make sure that, you know, each new hire that you bring in uh, like understands why you're pricing the way you do, the way that you talk to the customers, all those pieces. And I think transparency always trumps, you know, just being very opaque about everything. Because ultimately, in order to grow, everyone's got to be bought into the same mission and showing them how they get there, showing them how they earn their paycheck. Uh, those are all really important things to, to building a business where people want to work and like stay working versus, you know, a turn and burn uh, style business. Yeah, absolutely. That's the, that's the other art of it uh, in business is keeping the people, keeping them happy and, and making them, not making them, but, you know, having them at least sharing your dream or the vision. And is it good enough? That's it. There's so many challenges, but, you know, I love working with the right people that, are either encouraged, they know they're doing the right thing, it's gonna work out, we can tell that we've we've fixed things, we got numbers in the right place, like, okay, we know we're doing good now. Um, and and then you, you, other people that I've just seen, just astronomical, which is always fun to watch. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, business business is great, it is something just you need to pay attention to, and I wouldn't say it's for, it's not for the faint at heart. Yeah, no, owning your business is a, is a whole separate endeavor. Well, uh, Brett, do you have any last words of wisdom or anything else you want to share with the audience here? Because uh, we've already found ourselves way over time really quickly just nerding out about all these different topics. <laughs> but is there any, any last last thing you'd like to drop? Yeah, I mean, just, you know, get, get comfortable. Uh, love your numbers. Get comfortable with them. Start looking at that profit and loss statement. If you have somebody that's doing it for you, just go ahead and call them up and say, hey, are those numbers, are those numbers right? It's not the... Um, you know, by the tenth of the month, and, and and if not, can we put some together that I can start reading on a on a um, like you know again a, a cadence? Yeah, oh, that's awesome. Well, thanks again, Brad, for popping on, um, sharing some some words here with me, and obviously making sure you know your numbers and you know working with a CPA that you can trust that knows the trades, all super important things. Uh, for everybody that's listening, tune in next week for another edition of the Super Pro Podcast. Thank you all. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, thank you, Roland. The Super Pro Podcast is brought to you by Housecall Pro, the leading platform for the home service industry. Housecall Pro streamlines your workflows and simplifies everything from scheduling and dispatching to communication and billing. Unlock the full potential of your home service business with Housecall Pro. Work smarter and more efficiently with streamlined workflows and detailed analytics. Win more business and serve your customers well, every single time. Join more than 40,000 home service pros who have already revolutionized their businesses. Work smarter with streamlined workflows, get organized with centralized information, and scale your business your way. Learn more at housecallpro.com.